Well, welcome everyone. Obviously, we're at intermission. Uh, we've just heard the first half of the concert uh, with the Overture to Candide, the Rodrigo Adagio, and the Hindemith Symphony in B-flat, but now we're getting to the real business of uh, today's performance, and that's the next two works with the one and only Jennifer Higdon. <laughs> we are so glad to have you back. Jennifer is, she needs no introduction, but she is here specifically because she is this year's winner of the Eddie, Eddie Medora King Prize, uh, which is an award endowed here at the University of Texas, a, a cash prize, but it recognizes a person's body of work over an entire career, and there is no more <laughs> deserving person to receive well, it this year you. than Jennifer Higgins. So we're so glad to have you <laughs> no, with it's us. it's good to be here. That was a nice surprise, that <laughs> award. And you know, it's so funny, you spend so much time by yourself writing in a studio that when someone says, hey, we're going to give you something for the body of work that you've done, you're like, oh, right. wait, there are a bunch of pieces, aren't there? <laughs> it's And it's not, because this is kind of the year, the, the season of Higdon in a way, right? Is, I mean, yeah. so, so many uh, stars have aligned, and it's only a product of all of the great work that you've done. But, you know, with so many, the Pulitzer Prize and Grammys, yeah. you know, more than you can display now. I know, so. I know. <laughs> I try not to look at that stuff. I just go back to writing the notes, actually. Of course, <laughs> yeah, which you are doing right now, almost, uh, you know. Yeah as you can find a moment while we're keeping you busy here yeah, in Austin, yeah. but uh, I know you're continuing to write music. So what are the projects that you have going on right now? Well, I just finished a string quartet for uh, the Apollo Chamber Players in Houston, and it's based on music from my opera, Cold Mountain, sure. my first opera, um, and making plans for a double percussion concerto for the Houston Symphony. So it's kind of nice to come back right. with my percussion concerto and right. because it makes me go, okay, this is what I was thinking I was writing this, and so I'm thinking about it, but I'm smack in the middle of a chamber opera actually right now so and that it the nice thing is it's very each one of these projects is very different sure so it i'm always kind of pushed to think outside my normal boundaries and kind of figuring out all right what works for this group or what works for that group and they all have different needs and different demands right well and we were just talking today that uh Hopefully there'll be a production of Cold Mountain yeah. uh, here in Austin in yeah. the in the near future. It looks like it's a very distinct possibility. That's yes. great. Yeah. That's wonderful because obviously uh, you know Cold Mountain before that time had had this been you know cooking around for a long time. Yeah, uh, you know it's it's interesting. I knew I was going to be writing an opera, but finding the story is always a, a thing and getting the rights. And it literally, for someone who writes eight to ten pieces a year like I do, to suddenly stop everything to work on an opera, but it was it was twenty twenty eight months, of which right. is a pretty long chunk of time. Right. And um, somehow, when you're writing opera, you get kind of pulled down into the world. <laughs> so of that, whatever that story is, but it was literally twenty eight months, seven days a week. So right. it was a different place to live. It was kind of amazing when I got it done, and I came up out of the tunnel. I'm things. sure. Yeah, it was a an amazing thing. But there are a lot of notes in that piece. You know, and I know every oh I know, and everyone does this differently. But while you were in the throes of composing yeah. Cold Mountain. Were you singularly focused on that, or were there still other deadlines to meet? And... You know, I actually cleared everything else. I right. didn't do anything else. Yeah, right. just I don't think I probably could have. I was sure. so in that world. Right. I would think you would have to be in yeah. a way. Yeah. So now, what is the chamber opera that you're working on? Yeah. What is that? What... It's a it's a piece for five singers and twelve instruments. So very different in size, and also probably about seventy seventy five minutes. And it's based on an original story kind of loosely based on an art theft that occurred back in 2010. So we're building a mystery around the theft, uh -huh. which is a little unusual for an opera. But in the instruments are being used in a slightly different way. They're extended techniques. Great. Um, and the lead, Meredith Arwadi, is phenomenal. She's a contralto, but right. what a voice. And so <laughs> I'm kind of excited. I've known her since she was a student at Curtis, sure. which means I kind of got to know her voice and her personality. So I'm kind of building it around her. Oh, that's going to be spectacular. When will the premiere be? Is September 2020 in okay. Philadelphia with Opera Philadelphia's Opera Festival. They have every fall five operas that go on at the same time, four of them which are new. It's a right. pretty big undertaking. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's uh, obviously that continues. And then, the, as you mentioned, the double percussion concerto. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it's great to for us. as uh, the, the audience who's watching this webcast are primarily band people. Yeah, you yeah. Know, 
band nerds like me. Yeah, you know? <laughs> I love band. I started in band. That I know. You, beginning. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk to you about that because that's you come from that world yeah, too. Yeah, I know. It's uh, there was something about and the high school I was in was uh, the marching aspect was very big, and we mm-hmm. used to go every weekend to competitions. But the thing I remember thinking because that was my early experience, I started late on my instrument was you get a lot of power it's a lot of there's a lot of emotion mm-hmm. in band playing and this is the thing i just loved about it. it was the very thing that made me decide i wanted to be in music and you were a flutist yeah uh still are i don't want to no, say actually, were. i'm not <laughs> okay. i have to say they revoked my license because i haven't played in about 10 years so I, I don't know if i can actually say i'm a flutist anymore <laughs> right forced into retirement right exactly say, <laughs> say but uh and you went to bowling green is yeah that went to bowling green state university for my undergraduate mm-hmm. and, and that was in flute performance and then i went to philadelphia to go to Curtis in composition. I'm not sure how I got in to Curtis actually, and then went up the street to the University of Pennsylvania. Right. So it was a. Uh, it's been a great trajectory, and I'm so lucky because I get to work with a lot of really incredible performers. Sure. It's. Uh, I think my life is extraordinarily charmed. Well, it uh, those things happen for a reason, you know. So. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and so you, yeah, it's amazing. You you were at Bowling Green State. Yeah. Did you study with Judy Bentley? I by did. The way? Okay. She was phenomenal. I played in band under Mark Kelly. Right, rest his soul. Was, yeah, I yeah, know. Yeah. It was just, and I remember taking his conducting class. I loved his sense of humor and his exacting, get everything right in rehearsals, and it was just an inspiring. Inspiring experience. Yeah, and then, like you say, you go from Bowling Green to Curtis. Yeah, that's a uh, so it's now a really, that's a different world. It's right? a totally different world because suddenly it's, you go from a university to a conservatory. Sure, setting. more smaller, more right, mm. and also I think more of an emphasis there on orchestra because there is no band in Curtis. Course. But it was also just incredible being around. That's they have a T-shirt that says that. Right? Yeah, that's I think it's. <laughs> they actually, I think they made a Curtis uh, athletic department T-shirt, which I always thought was very funny. I thought, what is that bow chucking or something? But but uh, I think it's actually for the the ping pong tournaments we sure. sometimes have there. But it was uh, that's the thing I kind of loved because Penn was also very different than Curtis and Bowling Green. So right. the experience of getting education in different kinds of schools, I really value that. It was uh, different ways of thinking and approaching learning because sometimes learning is teaching yourself after you've left school to learn how to kind of break down problems and right. figure out how to make things work. So And you have a distinguished roster of students, people yeah. who have studied yes. with you over the years. You have Ganey Charlotte on our I faculty know. among them, you know, who's just uh, a brilliant composer. He and is. Wonderful he truly teacher. is. I know. It, it's amazing to see your students go out and get teaching jobs. Isn't it great? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's totally cool. Right. So let's let's talk a little bit about what people are getting ready to hear now after intermission. Right. right. Two pieces of yours. One very brief mm-hmm. machine. Right. And then, of course, the percussion concerto, which we'll spend a little more time talking about. But, right. Uh, so they're, tell us about those. They're both very different pieces. Uh, machine is very new. It's, it was an orchestra piece commissioned by National Symphony in Washington, D.C. They had a series called the Encore Series. So whatever right. the instrumentation was of a particular concert, they would call a composer and ask them to create a work for that instrumentation. And so it basically was an encore. It wasn't even listed in the program, but it would just be tacked on at the end. Sure. The orchestra would launch into it. Uh, last year, I was completing a residency at UMKC, and one of their doctoral students uh, looked at the score and decided for uh, part of his portfolio he wanted to arrange it for wind ensemble. And he did a marvelous job. I was so busy last year, I didn't get a chance to really have a lot of back and forth with him, so he did right. a lot of it on his own. And I was blown away by how great David it Blonde, by the way. Yeah, yeah. David Blonde, right. he did a phenomenal job with it. I mean, really, and took great care. I think he even learned finale, I believe. when I, So not right. only was he doing an arrangement for the first time, in wow. life, but he was also learning a notation <laughs> program, which is right. kind of extraordinary. But it was wonderful to, to work with him and then just to hear the whole thing come to life. Sure. You know, it was, uh, and Steve Davis conducted it, and we just... It was an incredible experience, and uh, I think David did a great job with it. It's really great, but it's it's a brilliant little piece anyway. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. It's, it's it's amazing. I didn't think it would work that well. I was kind of incredulous when it did work. Uh-huh. Yet even as an orchestra piece, I wasn't absolutely sure. It's not so easy to do like a two minute piece. Right. Yeah. You're like have to get the ideas out right away, <laughs> but you don't want to be all over the place. So I feel like. Uh, much to my surprise, it works. It seems to work really well. It works well for band. Yeah, it it does. I think it makes a very effective piece. That'll be conducted by. Uh, she's known here as Gift. Uh, she's from Thailand. Yeah. Uh, 
Pamorn Pan Komal Pamorn, who is on the faculty at Mahidol University and is finishing up a doctorate here right. in conducting. So she'll uh, conduct that. And then we do the percussion concerto, right. which uh, is such a magnificent piece. And I and mentioned to you that this is the first time that I've done the piece, and I can't figure out why I've never gotten around <laughs> to doing it until now because it is so terrific and the soloist is just our incredible friend and colleague tom burrett who yeah. just kills this thing it does kill it it is not an easy piece i mean it really is a concerto it uses so many colors so many instruments um it's kind of incredible when i planned it out thinking about the fact that i wanted vibes and marimba and small percussion on a trap table and a drum set right it's a lot to arrange but you also really depend on the percussionists to be able to make their way from station to station of course. and to be able to do all of these things they all require different skills they all require different muscles different kinds of mallets and it's quite impressive and in this particular concerto there's a challenge of i wrote an extensive part for the percussion section within the ensemble so they're always at the back of the section of the orchestra or, or the band whatever your ensemble however it's laid out but they're as far from the soloist as you can yes. get <laughs> and so there's a unique challenge there in getting them courted because they're there's very tight interplay and right. they're often having to play exactly what the soloist is playing so right they, and um, the the piece was originally composed for the Philadelphia Orchestra right. they commissioned That's right. uh, the were and Colin Curry gave the first performance That's right absolutely yeah. And it was the president's own marine band that asked me to arrange it for a symphonic band sound, and uh, it works really yeah. well. Which is interesting because those some of those gestures are very string-like gestures. Right. But uh, so to transfer them into a a wind band world was an interesting challenge, but it it seems like it works pretty well. It works beautifully, and I th I appreciate the fact that when you made the wind band mm -hmm. setting. It was. It certainly does not come off as a formulaic approach. Right. You know that. Okay. Good, well, good, it's always. <laughs> yeah. It's always the violin. So I'm always going to put them here. It, you know. But the colors, I think, yeah. then become unique to the wind ensemble. Right. Right. And yeah. In fact, I've actually had people tell me they prefer the wind ensemble version. So right. I think it's great if people can have an opinion about that. It means it, the piece is working one way or the other, which I'm always glad for. I always take chances, and I'm never quite sure is this going to work. <laughs> Right. But um, but it's also fun to be able to share a piece that really has it allows the players even in the ensemble not only the percussions but there are enough solos yes within the ensemble to allow them to kind of show off their talent their gift right and, and I think it's rewarding music as you just alluded to for every player in the ensemble yeah. so that they're not feeling okay this is just you know. This is the concerto, checking their yeah, watch, right, you know, right, but, right. but no, it's everyone is involved. And this is like a, like all of the good percussion concertos, right, right, right. <laughs> I'll just say. <laughs> but this one in particular is such an audience piece, I think, yeah. because of the visual aspect, the soloist moving on stage, going to the different stations. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's a very, very thrilling piece. To witness. Yeah, it's a, and Tom sounds amazing. I mean, it's really real power in his playing and real skill. Also, the subtlety and the fact that the percussionists have a chance to do uh, basically they they're improvising in the middle. They've got their own cadenza, right. and it, I love hearing what each person brings to that. But the interesting challenge here is the cadenza starts with the percussion section and the soloist and yes. ends with just the soloist in the middle. But that coordination of going in and out is not such an easy thing, and right. uh, the players sound fantastic. They're, I think they're doing a beautiful job yeah. with it, so I'm, I'm very anxious for everyone to hear it. But also, um, I realize that many in our webcast audience aren't in Austin, and so they won't be able to attend the performances, but uh, tomorrow night with the, uh, sorry, uh, on Monday night with the UT Symphony yes, Orchestra, right. uh, performance of your oboe concerto That's with right. Andrew Parker. Right. It's going beautifully. And, uh, several, and all Higdon evening with the new music ensemble plus other things lectures composers form so we're we're keeping you that's busy good. while good. you're here I think that's actually good so. <laughs> but you've been so generous with your time and you were so we just come we we're filming this uh one day before and we just finished a dress rehearsal and ah. you were just wonderful uh, it's a it's not hard to be wonderful when you have good colleagues so <laughs> <laughs> i find it inspiring hearing what's going on in the music making so I'm inspired. Well, the the piece is brilliant. Both pieces are, and it's so great to have you with us. So we can't thank you enough for taking the time. It's and a pleasure. Uh, looking forward to the performances. Sounds good. Great. Thanks so much, Thank Jennifer. you. Yeah.